This is Remote Ruby. Have you any remote idea as to the meaning of the word? Mm. Boop. What's up? What's up? The, what the sound that? of what people's was that thing eardrums did? bleeding and oh, no. unsubscribing to Remote Ruby. <laughs> or that was our special brainwave to force you to hit that subscribe button. I learned this week that Adidas sells big and tall. Yeah. So I was trying to match your level, but basically anything in my size, not even just Adidas, anything I can buy in my size, is just like old man clothing. So Yeah. You need to I mean, start your shoe own fits. menswear line. That's the problem. The shoe doesn't fit because <laughs> I have wide feet. So New Balance, I have the widest foot they sell for, and I can only buy like three different pairs of shoes in the world, it feels like. So. And they're all <laughs> substitute teacher shoes. Yes. At a certain point, you just have to be a celebrity or something to get those custom shack shoe sizes. I'm sure like, yeah, we'll make you whatever you want or whatever you need. Does but if Shaq you're a regular... Sell shoes? I mean, he's got to work with somebody to make it. He he's, he's got a shoe line. Where, is where's he his like shoes at? Knitting his shoes together at home? No, I don't <laughs> think we should talk about who's making his shoes, but... <laughs> well, the problem with shack size shoes is they're long, but they're not wide. Like the problem... Ah... So like for Chris's wedding, they had to like special order my shoes in and it's not like they're like, oh, we can fit your size wide. I'm like an 11 and a half really wide. They're like, oh, here's a 16. Hopefully it fits. Oh. So <laughs> yeah, uh, they were clown shoes. You're only 11 and a half. I'm a 10. Dang. Big hmm. feet. <laughs> cool. Cool. I feel like Glad we had this call. <laughs> I feel so insecure right know. now. I don't know what, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> I will say you and I have talked about some things that other people should never know we talked about. And that makes me the most uncomfortable is the conversation we just had. Oh, yeah. No, I feel weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel uh, real weird. Bet. Bet. I feel good now that I'm back. Oh, good, 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 good. There's stuff to talk about, I'm sure, but it hasn't been the most Ruby news centric week. So one thing I did just want to mention I'm saddened, as I think we all are, about the passing of Chris Seaton. Chris came on our show pretty early on. He was, I feel like he was maybe one of our like first round of guests. It was back when it was just Chris and I. And I was actually really nervous to have Chris on because Chris just so intelligent. But that conversation, he was so kind and so gracious and never once made me feel like I was lacking because I didn't know those things. He was very encouraging. And that was a very fun conversation for me. And that that conversation really set the most positive projection of Chris Seaton in my mind. And then only briefly got to talk to him at Sin City. But a huge void in our community. And we will link that episode in the show notes if you want to go listen to it. But just wanted to acknowledge how much we will miss Chris and how much of an impact he's had on lots of people. I don't know how you shift out of that, but I'm going to do my best here to get us on some Ruby related content. The lowest hanging fruit we could talk about is we just finished another Hanami stream about 30 minutes ago. So that was my third. I tried a Tuesday night this week. I didn't see that. Yeah, I did it twice this week. I wanted to test what night time was like because my domain, that's what you say. Last week we had average like 15, 20 people and I didn't think I'd have that many, but I was thinking like Tim Riley in Australia is 17 hours ahead of me. Of course, he went there this week because he was working on his RubyConf Thailand talk, but it was, I'll put it this way, it's a much more intimate setting. <laughs> There's like three or four of us, which is probably good because... I tried to run a migration and I spent 20 minutes figuring out why it went wrong. Ah. And it's because when I close the Hanami server with control C, it shuts down Puma, but it doesn't fully shut down something. I've, and so I've seen that in other things before too with Puma. Okay. So the database connection was still around. And so like it was actually, I don't know, probably not running the migration properly. <laughs> I was really glad to figure it out. But so it's probably good. There weren't a lot of people there for that. But today we spent two hours and we built some associations and we built authentication from scratch. Yeah. And it was a hell of a ride. It was fun. I'm not working today. You're not either, right? We're both off today. Yeah. So I woke up 
and it was like 10 a.m. or something. And I'm like, oh, is it Jason's stream time? And I pulled up in your stream and you had just gone live. I'm like, sweet. I had just shown your passport photo by the time. Yeah, you that's what Andrea <laughs> texted me immediately. And was like, you missed this. And I was like, what <laughs> has he done? I mean, you knew better. Well, I asked her if you roasted me and she said no. And I was like, oh, damn, that would have been funny. <laughs> no, I just literally like I have my pre-roll thing, which is literally my head rolling around. And then when I can't cut to my screen, you were just zoomed in all the way. Nice. I cut out your passport details. It's just your Thank photo, you. So Good. I sent Jason a picture of my expired passport and the picture is from 10 years ago. And apparently I look the exact same. So that confirms that I am still a child. Yeah, you could have not sent me like the passport information, just sent me the picture and said, I'm Benjamin Button and I would have believed it. Ah, uh-huh. okay, cool. <laughs> cool, 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 cool. I got to write that down for my therapist. <laughs> no, it was fun. I feel a lot more comfortable. I've only done like three hours. Well, I guess, no, that's not true. It's probably been five or six hours now of Hanami. I feel a lot more comfortable with it. Like I feel more comfortable using ROM. It's more verbose in certain areas than Active Record. I like the concepts, so it's cool. Today we modified a chain set to use bcrypt to encrypt a password. That was cool. I don't know. It's really helpful having Peter there because he created ROM and he can always tell me what I'm doing wrong. Yeah, or it is fun. ROM, to watch. ROM, like CD-ROM. Some people in the chat were like, "Yeah, I would want to do this type of thing too," but I don't know. What if I get things wrong or whatever? To me, that's part of the fun. That's part of the reason like I like being in the chat. It's like, hey, it, it feels like a collaborative pairing session almost just with like less hands on the keyboard. And it's kind of fun to like have the streamer run into an issue and then everyone in the chat starts like typing what they think it is and someone eventually gets it. And, it's, and it feels like the group has success and you all feel like a sense of success from that. So I say if you're interested in streaming, just do it. What's the harm in trying? Like you may not get many people in the chat the first few times, but if you do it on a consistent day and time, which I think is why once a day, like a lot of people showed up again. Yeah. And I think if you do it consistently on a consistent time and people are like, oh, this is the time that I hop into this person's stream, then you can totally build a viewer base, build people who will keep coming back, maybe even have some of these library authors drop in. So if you're interested in streaming Ruby, do it because someone said in the chat today, like more and more people are doing it. And I agree. It's really fun to watch. And I hope more people do it. Emily Samp was talking on Twitter today about possibly doing a stream going through Advent of Code with... Sorbet. Sorbet. Yeah. And I was like, that would be super cool to watch. So I just want to shout that out. More people streaming Ruby. That's what we like. CJ Avia has been doing Advent of Code and Ruby on YouTube as well. If anybody wants to check those out, I always... Really, really enjoy him doing his videos. I guess they're not live streams, but they're fantastic screencasts. Yeah. I mentioned this in the stream because a couple of people were saying they like want to stream, but they're like nervous too. And I'm like nervous as hell when I do it. But I started writing a post today. I don't know what it'll be, if I'll even share it, but about how much regret I have for not sharing more stuff in my career. I'm trying to change that now. I've always been scared of rejection and looking like a dumbass, even though like, I don't mind looking like a dumbass when it comes to like non-code things, but you know, when it's your livelihood, it's a little scary, but I don't know. People have been really cool and receptive on this stuff, like the tsunami stuff we're doing. Cause I just admit like, I don't know. And I don't know, sometimes maybe I lose some viewers at those points, but a lot of people hang out. It's cool. I mean, people are there to learn. You're there to learn. That's all you promise and that's all you're given. You can't let anybody down that way. So I think that's yeah. the way to look at it. You're not telling them, hey, we're going to go do this thing. And then, oh, shoot, I don't know how to do it. It's, hey, I'm learning. You can learn with me and see how I figure out problems or whatever. There's lots of, maybe you don't know or you don't learn the specific Hanami stuff to go build things perfectly the first time around. You learn how to debug with Jason and whatever else. There's a lot of good takeaways. It can feel that way. And I certainly have because I've done my fair share of videos over the years. And it definitely feels scary. But like at the end of the day, if you can make sure you frame it right, you can teach anybody who is newer than you. And that's perfect. That's what you're trying to do. Or if you're learning, people want to learn with you. So you don't have to be perfect. Nobody's looking for that. Or if they are, they're in the wrong place. Right. Yeah. Away. 
<laughs> yeah. Do it for you. Do it because you want to learn and you want to like share what you're learning with other people. And people who are interested will naturally just kind of follow. And people who aren't won't. And that's totally fine. Yeah. I said this today, like I almost wish it was like a Zoom call, which isn't sustainable, but it's just like fun, like having people there hanging out. That's the thing. The thing I love about conferences. It's the thing I love about streaming so far. Like being on Rubber Duck Dev Show. That's the first time I had been on like a live stream thing like that. And like people hanging out in the chat and stuff. I was like, oh, this is cool. It's kind of what inspired me to want to try and do this. You can do collab streams too. So like if someone else was streaming their side, you could bring them in almost. Like there's a way to do that. I don't, I don't know the cool. specifics of it. But so just to encourage other people like, hey, you could stream too. Yeah, do it. Another cool thing. So I've been working on that active record cookbook thing. And by thing, I mean the Active Record Cookbook. And to support myself in some of the lessons inside the project I'm working on, I just brought in like Active Record and a couple of models and I load it to a console. And so I have like an interactive, it's not a Rails console, but an interactive Ruby environment with Active Record. And I'm thinking about shipping the book with that. It's just a free thing because you can load it up and like every example I have in the book so far is recreatable there already. I don't know if that will add any value or not, but it's been valuable for me while I'm writing it. Yeah, do it. I would like that. Do it. I dare you. Yeah, do that. You won't. You won't. <laughs> you won't. <laughs> Jason immediately drives to the airport. <laughs> I was telling some friends that story the other day and now how I'm trying to force you into a bigger trip. Dude, you didn't even have to coerce me. You just said it. And I was like, let's do it. Oh, sweet God. But yeah, I don't know. That was cool because I have it. If I have it, it's been a long time since I've just stood Active Record up by itself. And I know a lot of niceties around Rails and Active Record that you take for granted when you just pull up Active Record. But I have just like one big migration in this like setup script. It has seeds and everything. So you can reseed the database. I don't know. It's cool. It's fun just to hack around on stuff that's not work. Any deadline you're setting for yourself of when people can expect this content? I would like to have it before February 2023. Nice. You shouldn't put the year in there. That way you've, you have <laughs> yeah, ultimate yeah. flexibility there. I'll edit that <laughs> out. Edit that out. I would like to have it before February. <laughs> now I have, I don't know, 15 lessons written. And some of them are very succinct, right? Because I'm doing that like cookbook approach. So it's like, here's the problem I want to solve. You go to it. And sometimes there's just not a lot to say about certain queries. But I'm trying to get into some more complex ones. I started writing on dependency deletion, things like that, and the nuances and differences and like automatically dependent destroy, dependent destroy sync, dependent delete all. And just trying to like split out some of the nuances you can destroy async, but you can't have foreign key constraints. And like trying to fit that in into like a very small digestible lesson. It's fun. It's challenging because I want to be succinct and I want to be helpful. I don't necessarily want to use this as an opportunity to explain the history of. Those are the two hardest records. things. Succinct and being helpful. Like that's damn near impossible, man. So February, February. Yeah. <laughs> I'm super right, excited good. for this. Have you ever read the Anarchist Cookbook? No, I know of it, but this sounds like because something it, you have multiple copies of. Sounds like Jason is about to tell you how to build a bomb ass Rails app. Oh, with your active record queries. Oh, God. <laughs> All right, that's it for this week. Andrew, that's the most <laughs> impressive thing you've ever said. Oh, we can't top oh, that. The way you just tied those together. <laughs> yeah. Oh, geez. I, I talked to Andrew and Colin. They kind of encouraged me because I was nervous about the cookbook approach. Because I like announced to the email list, I was changing it and one person responded. So I was like, oh, did I screw up? But no, committing to it. Responding to the email can't be me. Yeah, I know. I added you to the repository of the content and I thought I would see how long it would take for you to find it and join. I haven't seen it. So (laughs) I guess I should open up my (laughs) notifications. Well, I'm just curious, did Colin kind of say the same thing that I said? Because I was very much like, yeah, I like this a lot better than this long narrative stuff. I just want the deets. We were on a Zoom call and he pulled like three Ruby related, Rails related cookbooks off his like bookshelf. They were older, like late 2000s when they released. We were working on building some content like a year or two ago. 
And that was kind of something that I was like, I want to do like recipes, like give people like the cookbook, give them just how to do this one thing. It doesn't have to be a narrative. There doesn't have to be a flow. It just like, right. it's like, like a reference resource. Like I like that approach much better. The bomb ass active record. Cookbook. <laughs> <laughs> I think it can give it a little more longevity as a resource. Like I know things in active record change, but you know, if it's an ebook, I can update it and I don't have right. to update a whole conglomerate. Like you said, narrative. That's why I made the stimulus reflex course free is I'm not going to go update that course. It's so intertwined. So I'm hoping this is a thing too. It's like you buy it and maybe you don't read it as soon as you buy it, but maybe you have it handy and when you need it, it's there. Right. So yeah, yeah. like almost thinking in blocks instead of like a whole thing. You could put these blocks other places. I always found those books the most useful personally, like in between, you know, a book that's like long ass story of here's how to do start to finish something versus the API docs that are like, here's literally all the options for this one feature. I really always want something that's in between that tells me, here's the thing, here's roughly why you would use it and the high level of applying it. And if I need to dig into the like nitty gritty details, API docs are there, but I don't want to have to read 400 page book to dig through that and find this one association thing right. that I'm trying to accomplish. So to me, this is like a reference that I could use all the time. You know, like the same reason you would buy Tailwind UI, you have all those components you can reference and then you're like intended to look at them and then modify them for your use case, which same thing here. Right. Yeah, you're trying to accomplish this thing. Go skip straight to this chapter. You don't have to read anything else in the book. It is yes. by itself. You can apply it whenever you need it. I think that stuff is the most useful to me. So I highly encourage that. That's something that every developer like can use at all times. Anyone can use this regardless of skill level. Like This would be just mm. as helpful to a junior as a senior. A narrative story may not be. Yeah. Part of that is I don't want to have, using the same moniker we've been writing, a bomb ass table of contents. That the idea is like, so I have comparison operators, right? Like let's say I'm equal to, I have a lesson for like, I need an active record query for calculating less than, less than or equal to is another lesson. Greater than is a lesson. Kind of have them split out. And the other thing that I've struggled with when writing this, because I said, I remember I like, I want to be succinct is I gave too many options at first. Here's how you do it with a template string, like a SQL literal, or here's how you do it with a range. And I was like, I think what I'm going to do right now is just give the option that I would use if I was writing this, not like all the options. And so here's how you do for less than, here's how you write it with a range for a date. Here's how you write it with a range for a number value. Here's why you can't use like two dots. You have to use three dots or whatever. Just very like one-liners. That's my yeah. goal. And that's helpful because a lot of times when I'm looking for how to do something, I don't care about the eight different ways to do it. I just want to know a way to do it so I can go immediately back. Like it's like the quickest thing I can get to the answer and go back to my code. That's what I'm looking for. So I think that's a good approach too. Cool. Well, thanks for yeah, the, uh, the encouragement. I just want to take a minute to thank our sponsor, Honey Badger. They are not only my favorite error and uptime monitoring service, but they've also added several awesome new features. One of those being the public status pages. So it makes perfect sense that your error and uptime monitoring tool can have a public status page for you to communicate any downtime outages with your customers. So whether US East 1 is down or you forgot to add a configuration file, Honey Badger is there for you to help communicate any downtime or outages with your customers. Plus, they've also added SSL certificate monitoring. So like many of us use these days, Let's Encrypt certificates expire every 90 days. And if for some reason you're a week away from expiring an SSL certificate, they can let you know ahead of time so that you can take care of it without any outages for your customers. Plus, managing the errors and things inside of Honey Badger has gotten even easier with Honey Badger Actions which you can use to automatically assign errors to yourself or another team member, add tags to different error classes and more. And they also have batch actions, which you can use on the search results 
to help manage your backlog of work to do. So Honey Badger is the place to check out for error and uptime monitoring, and it's only getting better. So check them out at honeybadger.io. I also agree with the curated examples. You're not trying to do everything. Like that's what the API docs are for, like for infinite options. You're saying, here's the way I would do it. This is the reasons why I do it this way. And that's what I'm paying for. I want to learn from you and why you chose those approaches. I don't need to know every approach that's available. I want to know this one has these trade-offs and that's why you generally use it. And maybe you include a reference to like, oh, you know, if there's, you know, maybe both ends of the range of variables or something and it's easier to just put it in a template string than do that or whatever. Like there are probably those nuances that are like, well... This is for 75% of cases that I use this and 25% I do this other one. And cool. That's what I would want to know. Like the battle earned bomb ass active record tips. (laughs) That's going to be my thing. If I ever tweet out active record tips, they're just going to all be bomb ass active (laughs) record tip. B-A-A-R-T. Bart. Bart. There you go. Hashtag. Yikes. Well, yeah, that's what I've got going on. That and we put some of the finishing functionality on our tip tap editor. It definitely has a lot more room for like finishing touches, but it has been a sweet, a learning experience. And you're, if I remember right, you're saving the JSON in the database instead of HTML, like action text. Yeah. So, what are the next things we have to do when we get back to work next year? Probably Andrea will work on it. I'm sorry. Don't say the year. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, then you can come back anytime. Yeah. Just don't tell Spencer. <laughs> Next time in we get January. To, when we get back to this thing sometime <laughs> in the future, we can't just now go drop it in everywhere. We've got to come up with a mechanism for converting this HTML that's been made in tricks into JSON structure for tip tap. Mm. And I don't think it'll be, maybe it's easier because I'm probably not the one working yourself. on it. I don't think it'll be too bad because. They only have one heading option. There's no tables. There's list, numbered list. So like should be pretty. Yeah, there's a minimal set yeah. of tags. As long as there's like this kind of generic structure, we should be able to use Nokagiri, parse it, and then take those nodes and convert them. The only one that's going to be maybe a little tricky is how Trix does when you drop an image in. It's like a figure and all that but if it's consistent then we can at least be like okay well this is actually an image node and we just need to convert that so i don't think it'll be fun but i don't think it'll be awful well it's fun for you because you're not doing it right fun for me because i won't be either (laughs) i offered to help but it's cool (laughs) kevin helped me quite a bit with the actual traversing of the nodes so i had the node structured like the tree and then he helped me come up with a mechanism for it And the mechanism he came up with was it's a visitor and this is what he uses in syntax tree. And so we can have multiple visitors. So one for HTML. And so when we need to render HTML, we traverse the JSON structure in the database and call like visit heading node and it generates an H1 or an H2. And that's been really cool. But what's cool about the visitor is we made one now. We need to convert this JSON we don't need to convert it. We need to transform it to give it back to tip tap. And the reason is because of attachments. So when you upload an image with active storage, we store the signed ID. We don't store a URL because if we're using a private service that can expire, what we're doing now is we have a separate tip tap visitor and it traverses and it basically just always returns the same JSON except for images and files. It sets a file preview well, mostly for images, which is a URL that's valid for you long enough to at least load it when you get into the editor. And that was awesome because that was just taking, not changing anything, just creating a new visitor, a new tip tap visitor, and mostly aliasing every method except the image one. So there's all kinds of room here if we need to do other things like render a special type of HTML for emails. We'll just make a new visitor. It's really cool. That is super neat. And not to take away anything from what you guys have done, but I just wanted to give a shout out to Connor for finally releasing the 0.02 version of Rhino Editor, which is exciting. Shout out, Connor. 
I know he's been working on that for a long time. That's yeah. a big, that's a big thing to do that. Cause he's effectively doing what you're doing, but actually like storing it in all of the HTML that's compatible with action text on the back end. So in theory, it's a huge feat. Huge. Yeah. Yeah. So in theory, you just drop this in and change out the front end from tricks and you have a highly customizable editor on the front end. I'm sure that there will be some interesting things of how do we go and do the, you know, sanitization of attributes and other tags and whatever. I'm sure there's bits in there as well, but I haven't tried it out yet, but I can't wait. I mean, tricks is a nice, clean, minimal editor and does a good job for basic stuff. But if you need tables and a lot more complex things, then you're up for writing either a lot of JavaScript or an alternative like this is going to be a good option. Exciting to see that as well. So I can't wait to give it a try. Yeah, it was cool to see Connor's editor. He has a demo of it in the browser. And yeah. it, selfishly, it's cool to know how tip tap works. Cause like I saw it, I was like, I under, I kind of understand what's happening here. And that was kind of fun. Who would have thought text editors would be such a unsolved problem in the year X. Yes. See, what there? <laughs> See what I did. That way we have evergreen content. This <laughs> podcast yes. episode will be always accurate forever. Cause I evergreen. guarantee you that text editors and file uploading just generally never get solved in a ever. nice way ever. <laughs> Yeah, that's always been surprising to me, like how ridiculous it is for file uploading to do that, to upload it in parallel or, you know, behind the scenes while you're editing the forms. And then you've got to block the form until that's edited or finished uploading and you get the ID. Then you save that. And it is so weird, you know? Yeah. And like you can't upload files directly to your web server because somebody's going to upload an eight gigabyte text file or something and then <laughs> right. you're going to run out of disk space. So it's such a weird situation. And like the current best option we have is let anybody upload anything to S3 and just delete it after X number of days. And it's like people could still upload ridiculous things up to there and you could try to validate it as well but they could still upload a bunch of crap to your site of tiny files or whatever and yep. it's just weird it is not a great solution but it's really the best we have and that seems very strange for 2020 x yes yes <laughs> or 20x yeah 20x that's our theme this week is time doesn't exist in my examples it was tough cuz i needed to show the difference between two dot and three dot ranges in terms of like being inclusive or not. And with dates, that's the difference of saying like time.ucc and just giving the date because that'll default to zero time soon. Mm -hmm. And then being like the very last second of a day. And so having to write out that timestamp was frustrating. So Chris, you tweeted some hot wire things. A fun. thing, yeah. A long time ago. I wrote the comments forum system on Go Rails and like it is written by a younger me, we'll say, and not quite as clean as I would prefer it to be. You know, is there this some is all UG, UGS? It used to be, yeah. But then okay. I like migrated stuff over to Hotwire as quickly as possible. So we had, I don't know, one of the it was like the install Rails on Windows 10 guide or something. You know, 500 comments or something. The page was getting a little slower to to render. So I basically went and just slapped a empty div with a loading thing in it and a stimulus controller to go make an Ajax request to grab the HTML for the comments and just toss it in a separate request. And it's been fine. It lived like that for up until now. And I was like, you know what? That's exactly what turbo frames were made for. So let's just replace that. And basically five minutes later today, I'm like, swap that stimulus controller, delete that stimulus controller, swap the HTML with the turbo frame and put a turbo frame around the response on the server side and voila, we're done. And it's lazy loaded and just built in now. And I was like, this is cool. But I want to take it a step further because right now it's still will render all the comments and we have like a reply button 
that has a hidden form that it will just unhide. So we like render all these empty forms that we don't really need until you actually click the button. So I want to just put a turbo frame around the reply button. So you click that and it renders the form and just have nested turbo frames like that. So that's my goal and it shouldn't be very hard, but. So we do something really cool with a custom turbo stream action too, which I don't think I've talked about yet. And if I have probably just in passing, but Shout out to my coworker, Mario, for coming up with this idea. It has served us really well, actually, where he created a custom stream action called Dispatch Event. And what it basically does is it takes in an event type, a payload, and it creates a custom event. And it also takes in a target. So if you pass in a target, then it will dispatch the event on that target element, which is really helpful if you have a container wrapping a ton of turbo frames. And you can put all these different types of event listeners for stimulus on it. And so, but if you do not pass in a target, it will just dispatch it on window. So this is coming really handy for us where we have some really complex turbo stuff that we've been working on. And as different turbo streams are executing and updating content on the page and like resetting frames and things like that, we can also dispatch all these events so that, for instance, when we make an update to something, we want to reset like a popover or something, or we want to close a popover. We could do that. Or we could clear something out of like JSON data store that we have or, you know, whatever. So this is a pattern that we've taken advantage of it a lot. It's really nice to like execute like these little custom actions whenever the turbo stream happens. Yeah. Do you remember the original demo of whatever comments or it was like a chat room that DHH had originally like released when Hotwire came out? And I always remember seeing you fill out the message form, you click submit, and it broadcasts to the chat room. But then he has to go build a stimulus controller just simply to clear out that box when it gets submitted. I was like, that's a weird rough edge to this whole thing. So like the one that I tweeted out earlier today was a custom stream action that's called reset form. And you just give it a form ID and it'll look it up and then call reset on it and clear out your form. So your submit action to broadcast would append the message to the bottom of the list and reset the form in two little turbo streams that get added to the page. And it's like very simple, but very convenient thing to have all of that in one place because his original example was this does something here. This other thing is all the way over here and needs to actually both happen at the same time. And it's just weird to know that these need to be happening at the same time, but they're in totally different places and you can't really tell what's going on from a quick glance. So there's lots of things that you can do with that. You could broadcast a event just to tell Chartkick to go update charts from the back end when you're doing like an import or something. All kinds of cool stuff that you can do with it. And this is like often JavaScript that you would want in weird places. Like some people might put it in line inside the body of the HTML and it's like, hey, just put it over in the stream actions and then just call that whenever you need it. And I mean, you could call those directly too if you wanted. You can make them reusable that way. You don't have to use a turbo stream to use it. You can just pass that in or whatever, as long as you set the right binding for, because this will be the element that it's going to operate on. So you just have to be careful that whatever you, you did with the custom call there was aligned properly. But yeah, it's a feature that I actually asked DHH about two days after Hotwire came out. And he was like, I didn't have very good examples at the time, but I knew like there's got to be some cool things we could do with this. And he was like, nah, not right now. Because I mentioned like browser notifications is a good example of like, just call one of those and Chrome can then do its native notifications or whatever. Yeah, that's cool. Shout out to Marco. I'm pretty sure he worked on all that stuff. Yeah. It's a big help for us. And I'm kind of excited to see what more we can do with it. Yeah, Yeah, Marco's got Turbo Ready. There's also... Yeah, yeah, the turbo power and turbo, yeah, that sounds right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Both of those are awesome though. Like extensions that you can just include and voila, you have all kinds of different actions you can take on there. And maybe that'll be one I'll pull request to them because I don't think there's like a reset form, but you could easily build your own or might not be a bad thing to include. 
Yeah, I was pairing with Nate on some turbo ready stuff last weekend. And we were writing like custom web components for debugging stuff. It was really cool. It was fun. So yeah. Nice. Sounds like some bomb ass pairing. It was. Yeah. I've written more JavaScript in the past month and a half than I ever have. And I've gotten better at it. Andrea, I got her love and react now. What can I say? That is mm, shame. That's an oversimplification. <laughs> she tweeted that she tolerates it now. I mean, I react is great at what it does. Moving that's mountains. The, that's the problem. Let's let me go on my soapbox for a minute. Oh, okay. uh, I just wanted everyone to know I rolled my <laughs> eyes. So that's why I had to say that. <laughs> all right. Uh, it. What is it? Just tell us. In a very small context, React is so good. I don't yes. want to build a single page app with it. But the, the way it can understand state and re-render based off that saves so much other code that I have to yes. write. That comes at the cost. The more you get into it, the less custom code, the more dependencies and crap you have that you have to debug. So it's not about yes. trade-offs. Yes. But I love it. I love it. I'm not poo-pooing on React. Let me be very clear. I think React is excellent at what it does. I just don't want to use it. What do you want to but use? But what do I want to use? Ruby. The project that we just finished at work, which I'm pretty sure I talked about a little bit last week. And you talked about how you wanted to avoid React on it. Okay, well then, perfect. Yeah, well, we did. And you so did we listen produced. to the episode today? I was like halfway through this morning, but I woke up too late, so... Coward. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa, Buster. Pump the brakes. Hold on. I just caught a stray. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I was cowardly this morning. <laughs> I haven't showered yet, so that's normally when I listen to it. But yeah, so, yes. You take a 45 to minute to hour long shower? Well, the episodes I run on double speed okay and i usually like you know no i just i just can't be alone with my thoughts so it has to be running sometime Been shower there. you know what else i've done this week what's that jason i've written css me too pure css i overwrote bootstrap classes this week please send your prayers to the address hey. below there's parts of writing css i miss and then there are certain things I run into that I'm like, I don't miss this part of it. I don't know. I reused the class a few times and it just worked, right? And mm -hmm. I was able to target certain things inside of it and it just worked. But then when the class name I wrote didn't fit what it was doing anymore, like it actually evolved into something else. So I had to rewrite the class name and go update everywhere. It's like, okay, I don't necessarily miss that part of it so much. But yeah. CSS is good. It's good. I like CSS. I'm not good at like modern CSS, but that's how I got my start was in front end. And so I still pretty proficient in that late 2000 CSS. And of course, today is XX. So yeah, yeah. And today we have X feature followed by other X feature. <laughs> and, and I'm excited and, for CSS X, which will introduce well, yeah, this well, new feature. It, yeah, that new X feature like is really cool. I've decided to try it out. If you've ever seen the syntax, it's X colon. And wait, I think you're talking about Alpine. Oh, wait, maybe. <laughs> or view. View. That's how we'll date ourselves. We'll talk about JavaScript frameworks that don't exist in 50 years. There we go. But this podcast right. still will. One day my kids are going to be of age and they're going to listen to all of these and be like, Dad was an idiot. They're not going to listen. They're not going to listen. No. <laughs> Let's be real. Maybe. See. This is your legacy, Jason. This is it. Yeah. Me making jokes at Andrew's expense for 40 minutes a week is... I derive immense enjoyment from it. All right. Well, we lost yep. Chris. We lost everyone listening. Yep. Doing old support as always. It's like my uh, new job, just doing support. Gross. Shout out yeah. to you. You're the real hero. It's my favorite. Is it mostly Hatchbox or is there much Go Rail support? Around Black Friday, there is because it's like, I saw that your sale was. A week ago, can I still get the discount? And I'm like, you know, no, no. lots of those things mean, or like no. people don't pay attention to the emails that say, hey, your subscription's renewing and they get charged and then they want a refund and no, you know, yada, yada, yada. Say the word no in a nicer way to like a chat GPT. Hey, that's what I was just copy, saying. Copying and pasting that across all your emails. Just wire up my customer support straight to GPT and let her rip. I, I tried to use it. it the other night to solve a ROM problem because I couldn't really? find it online. It didn't work. <laughs> Good try, though. 
I would be honest, if it would have found something that I couldn't find on the internet for ROM, I probably would have just packed it all up and Yeah, farming time. I would be the worst farmer. I know that's what we joke about like when we talk about changing careers. I'd be so bad at it. I'm not talking about farming food. Oh lord. See ya. Bye. <laughs> Later.